Here I want to go through electron configurations. So the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, so on and so forth. I want to go through kind of in three stages. I want to go through and talk about how to do it so you can come up with, with the answer. Then I want to talk about what that answer means. So what do these electron configurations represent? And then lastly, I want to talk, allude to at least, a little bit of why we do this. Okay. And along the process there, I want to go through a couple of exceptions to these as well and try and really block out the entire periodic table. Now, there are many ways to do electron configurations, one of which is just to memorize the order of all the orbitals and how many there are of each. There's 1s, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s, then 3p, then 4s, then 3d, then 4p, then 5s, and then 4d, and then 5p, and then 6s, and then 4f, and then 5d, and then 6p. But if you don't want to do that, the periodic table has been arranged for you in a way that's highly convenient. Now, in order for this to work, you would need helium to be located over here. So if we can kind of take helium in our minds and move it over to here, to this spot, then that will be our S block. And then everything that's over here will be our P block. Everything in here will be our D block. Now, we'll get to this a little later, but the D block is actually offset right here. So technically, the D block elements include these two down here, which should go right here. This is the start of the F block, which is down here. So let's highlight that as well. And these are also on the F block. So, the second thing you need to do is label each row. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The D's will be 1 behind your row, and the F's will be 2 behind. Now, at this point, there are only 111 questions that can be asked. And they are all, what is the electron configuration of this element? So if we pick an element and we say, tell me the electron configuration of magnesium. Then in order to get the answer to that, all you have to do is write down the row you're in, the block you're in, and how many squares, how many blocks of the periodic table are in that row and block. And you're going to do that reading left to right, top to down, until you get to that element. So for this one, I would say, okay, there's two blocks here, hydrogen and helium, which we've moved over to here. So in the 1s, the 1s block, I have two squares. Okay. Then I go down to the next row. Now I'm in the second row, I'm still in the s block, and I have two squares. Then I come over here into the p block. In the second row, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 squares. 2p6. Then I come down to the third row. Now I'm at my point, so I'm going to count until I get to it. 1, 2, 2. And that would be the electron configuration of magnesium. Now, the follow-up to that is, well, what did you just do? What is this product that you've come up with? And the answer is, is that this is all the electrons in magnesium, where every single one is, and what, what state it's occupying. Okay? So magnesium has 12 protons, and therefore the neutral atom will have 12 electrons. Two of its electrons are in the first energy level in an s orbital state. Two of the electrons are in the second energy level in an s orbital state. Six of them are occupying the second energy level p orbital states. And keep in mind there are three orbitals for the, for that, for the p set, the px, the py, and the pz. And then the last two are in the third energy level, these are your valence ones, and those are in an s orbital state. So if I add up these numbers here, two and two and two, six plus six is twelve, those are the occupations of my 12 electrons in the ground state for magnesium. It's where all the electrons are residing and what they're doing, and it's information about how those electrons are acting. Now, if we get into a more complicated element, it's a little further down. So let's go with iron. Iron gets into the D block. And when we get into the D block, the D block is one behind the row. So when I'm in here, I'm in 4S. But when I'm in this row, I'm in the 3D block. And when I get back to here, I'm back to 4P. So the D block will always lag one behind whatever your row is. Okay? So for iron, my electron configuration would go 1S2 for these two, 
2s2 for those two. 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, then 4s2. And now I'm in the 3D, so I'm going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3D, 6. So iron has 26 electrons. It has more orbital states that it's occupying, and they filled up from lowest energy to highest, off bot principle. And that would be my electron configuration of iron. Okay, there's, there's one more level of difficulty that we can get to here. So let's do that. And let's switch color for this, and let me find a really good spot for this. I'm going to do this right up top here. Give myself some room. So let's go ahead and do, oh, uh, lead. Okay. So lead would be a challenging one because this is 82 electrons. I have a lot of configurations to do. So I'm just going to kind of breeze through the beginning. It's going to start off 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's going to take me to neon. Third row, I'm going to go to 3s2, 3p6. Okay. Fourth row is going to be 4s2. Then my Ds are one behind, 3d10. And then my Ps are back to normal, 4p6. Now, if you're sitting at home and you're wondering why, one, you don't need to know. Okay. But the reason why these are behind is, is partially how we structured the periodic table uh, and, and, and to reflect this, but also that, um, really I shouldn't say that, it's not how we structured the periodic table, but the d orbitals are actually not behind if all the other orbitals are empty. So it's, it's just the, the oddity of the d orbital shape and the distance from the nucleus that, that oddity causes them to experience more repulsion than the other orbitals. And so these end up getting pushed into a higher energy state as you start to fill the one and the two and the third energy level. And they get pushed up high enough that they're actually comparable to the 4s states. Okay. Now, I left off here at Krypton, 4p6. So now I'm going to the fifth row, which is going to be 5s2, 4d10. So again, my d's are one behind, 5p6, which takes me all the way to Xena. <coughs> Now at this point, I'm kind of running out of room, but we're going to go down to here. So I'm at 6s, now let's slow down. So, so these two here would be my 6s2. At that point then I start the f block. The f is 2 behind, so I'm starting at 4f. The f starts here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it's the first 14. Now different periodic tables are arranged differently. Some will have lutetium up here, some will have lanthanum up here, some will have a gap up here, some will have 15 down here, some will have 14 down here. But the key idea is that if you start counting here, when you get to the end of the 6s, the 57 is the start of the 4f. Okay? And then that will go for 14 elements all the way to a terbium. Then lutetium starts your 5d. And that will go lutetium through hafnium all the way up to gold before you get to the 6. I'm sorry, all the way up to mercury before you get to the 6p. Okay, so for this one, I'm going from lanthanum through cerium all the way to terbium for my 4f14. Now, the reason why we move this down here is because if this were put in the middle here, that would double the length of our periodic table, which is already quite large. And these really don't get used that much. So we, we, we relocate them down here for space saving but that can get really confusing when we're getting to these electron configurations. Okay. Now, after 4F14, I'm now at lutetium. Now I'm in 5D land. So I'm, I'm in the sixth row, I'm in the D block, I'm one behind 5D. So 5D1 through all the way through 5D10. Okay. Now I'm at the final point. Now I'm at my square. So I'm in the 6P, and I've got 1, 2, so 6P2. Now that's an incredibly long electron configuration, it would be very long and tedious to write out. There is a shortcut method for that. What you can do is if I ask you for lead, instead of doing that whole process, you can go to the previous noble gas. So one row up, what's the noble gas, and you can write that down in brackets. And when you write down that noble gas in brackets, that represents the electron configuration of that particular element. 
So this is the whole 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3p6, 4s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6. That's, that's that electron configuration. So then I can just start in my final row. And so now I can just write down 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, 6p2, which is significantly shorter. That's still kind of long, but compared to what I had done previously, it's much, much easier. And for other elements, it can be really simple. If I were to write down something like Krypton 5s1, that's the electronic configuration of rubidium, but I just saved myself a, a good chunk of time. Now, why do we do these? Well, because what you're about to do after electron configurations, probably, is you're going to go into bonding, and you're going to look at how do chemicals react the way that they do? How do they end up? And the answers to that a lot of times lies into how the electrons and protons are oriented. And so the fact that you know rubidium only has one valence electron carries a lot of weight for determining how it's going to react with things. And so electron configurations is a, is a more specific way of kind of orchestrating valence electrons. And, and we get a deeper understanding then of what's happening in specific bonding interactions that we don't get when you just look at like a Bohr model, say, or something that's a little simpler. Okay. Now, there are some exceptions to electron configurations. So, if we look at chromium, what we would expect chromium to be is, is that we would expect it to be argon, 4s2, 3d4. But when we actually look at spectral data for chromium, what we do find is that it's not that. That's argon, 4s1, 3d5. Okay? And that's something that often gets introduced in high school chemistry but doesn't really get explained correctly. So I'm going to go through and, and kind of talk to you a little bit about that. I'm going to, I'm going to redraw that a little bit. I'm going to have my 4s orbitals and 3d orbitals. And this is a confusing thing here, but, but essentially think of it this way. The gap between these two is very narrow. Okay? And we write that the 4s is, is lower in energy and that the 3d is higher in energy. But in reality, it depends on how many electrons you have in the preceding levels and how many you have in those levels itself. And so these two are very, very close. And here's what actually happens. The 4s is further away from the nucleus. So when you put electrons, and you have an empty 4s and an empty 3d, the electrons go into the 3d orbitals first. And so if I have my set of five orbitals and my set of one orbital, then, then when I put an electron in, it goes into here. Underneath this, though, are the 3p and the 3s and all the other electrons, and they're very close to this. And so the repulsion from that will move that into the 4s orbital state. Okay. So, so when I'm looking at potassium, which is 4s1, the electron actually goes in through the 3d and then gets promoted into the 4s orbital based on the repulsions that it experiences here. Okay? And if you go to take away that electron, it will be removed from the 4s1, but it went through the 3d to get there. Now, if we start to then add more electrons to this, so we put an electron into the 3d, it gets promoted to the 4s put another one in, it gets promoted to the 4s. Okay. And then we start to fill in the 3d orbitals according to Hund's rule and so on. Now what happens in this case is, is when we look at this, we've now got a case where this electron here can experience less repulsion by taking place in this orbital state that's unfilled than it can by being paired up with an electron that's very close to it. And so, and so this is not based on a half-filled or a filled orbital scheme or something like that. You may have heard that like electrons like to be in full orbitals and it makes them happy. That's not true. Electrons don't get happy. They're just electrons. They do, however, move to the places that will minimize their energy. And in this case, being away from other electrons, keep in mind, so if we, if we look at this from a p-orbital perspective, and here's a p-y and a p-x orbital that when I, when I put an electron into one of these states, that to put a second electron into the same one puts it in a closer vicinity. And these are, these are negatively charged objects. 
And it can go here, okay? I'm not saying it can, I'm not saying there's a quantum restriction, I'm not violating Pauli's exclusion principle. But to put it in here, just for basic physics, is going to minimize your repulsion. And so very similar to Hund's rule, we see that effect come about in the 4S and 3D states where we get electron configurations. Now, the ones that are going to show electron configurations are going to be the ones that are at the 3D4, or 4D4, or 5D4 states. And additionally, the ones that are at the D9 states originally. So if I were to say what silver is the electron configuration, then for silver, what we would expect is, we would expect it to be krypton followed by 5s1, 4d10, rather than 5s2, 4d9. Now I know for a lot of people the, the implication that's there is fill up your orbitals, half fill your orbitals, okay? So if we look at a 5s and a 4d, then we can look at it and say, okay, well, well 4d10 gives me a full set of d orbitals, and, and the 5s is half filled, but the reality is these are all based on repulsions, and there's, there's less repulsion by putting that electron here than there is by putting that electron here, and so that's what dictates where that electron is going to go. Keep in mind, this electron is entering through the 4d and can be promoted to the 5s by repulsion, and in this case, it, it, it does not happen. It stays in that state. And reality-wise, you are going to see this electron in the state sometimes. You're just going to see it as this more frequently than you are as 5s249. Okay? All right.